Okay. I would like you to be upstanding. I'm reciting the mascara with me. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Okay. All right, today I have the honors of the the honor of talking to you about an arhat that I say would is an inspiration or a role model to me and I hopefully by the end of my this small speaker this small sermon or discussion uh, would be an awesome inspiration to you as well. Let's hope I can do justice to his qualities as well. So today I'd like to talk about uh, an Arhad who I feel is one that is extremely powerful. But yet he doesn't use his power. It's funny because, as we all know, throughout history, power usually is something that, when given to humans, is something that destroys them or is used to their advantage and it ruins their lives and lives of others. But this Arhat, this, this, this great person, this great Arhat, has the power but doesn't use it for his benefit. So some of you may have guessed already. Today I'm I'm going to talk to you about the story of Muhammad Galanadeva. Uh, as I as I retell the story, I like you all to imagine you are in his shoes or you are in his life. Experience what he would be feeling in that moment because as you may see that He has done many things that you and I Well, well you will you, you see you'll see you'll see Okay So <laughs> a long long time ago, right in a town called Koita near the city of Rajagaha In the clan called Moggallan, which is a well-known, respected, admired clan at the time, a baby was born. Now, this baby, his parents called him Kolita, named him after well, the town that they were in. Now his father, now his baby's father. Well, he was he was a very well respected person, and he was prominent. They they lived in a prominent family. The where usually the town major was selected from. They were in a high caste, and therefore this father was a petty king. So this child, or call it a baby called the lived in <laughs> lived with wealth and honor and he didn't see much suffering or he didn't see much sorrow in his life on that same day as fate over this sir or his to-be best friend was born on the same day. Now, Upadisa and Kota were basically best friends. They were inseparable. <laughs> they, they, uh, if you ask people who know them, they'll say that 
if you see Kolata, you are bound to see Upadis nearby. If you see Upadis, you're bound to see Kolata nearby. They were inseparable. They used to do everything together, whether it's learning, whether it's playing. When they, they do everything together. Soon as they grow up, they get to see each other's qualities. Kolata can see that Upadis was more adventurous, was more daring, was a much braver person. But Kaurita was more of a person that preserves or well, cultivates or enrich things that he has. But even though they had very different qualities, they hardly fought with each other. They hardly had an argument or ever had anything or had ever had any disagreements. But you see, in their family, Kolata was the only child. So, as you, you can guess, he had a lot of a lot of hopes behind him. But whereas Upadissa, he had three brothers and three sisters. Now, as time goes on, this friendship strengthens. It strengthens, uh, it strengthens to the point where the opposite sex or females didn't have, they didn't have much interest in them. But they may not be interested in women, but they are still drunken with youth. They're still drunken with health and well, life itself. And Kolta and Upadissa were the leaders of their group of friends. It is said that um, when they go uh, to play in the river that's nearby, uh, the friends of Kolita would go on ho- horseback, whereas the friends on, of Upadissa would go in palaquins. Now they lived their life like this for many, many years. And soon they grew to the age where they were able to go to a special festival. A festival that takes place every year in Rajagaha. It's a public celebration, uh, celebration which was called the Hilltop Festival. There are many, fest- uh, many popular shows and uh, many events, dramas, so on and so forth. And Kolita and and Kolita were looking forward to go to this festival because they've heard a lot about it. And so with their keen anticipation, they even reserved seats to get the best seats to these shows, these dramas, and so on and so forth. So they couldn't wait until they went on the first day. So when the first day arrived, they were full of excitement. Like the shows they were, at that time were amazing in their eyes. They laughed, they got they got excited, and so on and so forth. And therefore, obviously, they reserved seats for day two as well. But on day two, they weren't as satisfied. Day two left them feeling discontent. They weren't fulfilled. But yet, they reserved seats for day three. But on the night of day two, Kolita couldn't fall asleep. He kept tossing and turning in his bed. There was one, there was, there was, he was, his thoughts didn't let him fall asleep. Because in his mind, the question, what is the use of all this? What is, the, what is the use of going to this festival? Kept going through his mind. Is there anything worth seeing? What are the benefits of, of life of enjoyment? Of, or life of pleasure seeking? 
after a few years, even the actors will become old and feeble. Well, in the future, they will also die. And they will also be reborn. Wait. Wait, wait a moment. Which also means we will also die. And I will also be reborn. Well, the actors can't help themselves. They can't stop it themselves. Then how are they supposed to help us? Well, instead of wasting our time in these festivals, we should find a path. We should find a, a path to stop it. But on that same night, Upadesa also had a, sta- a strange thought. He had a, he had the same uh, he had a thought similar to the one that Kolta had, but. He also had a thought that this, like the show, shows truth of rebirth, but yet the jokes suppress the truth and the the truth and the seriousness of this of this of rebirth. But it's almost like we're in, we're in an illusion in an in, 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 in an illusion. So the next day. On day number three in this festival, they both went to their reserve seats. But, as we all know, whenever we see our best friend, well, we know our best friend so well, we know when they feel sad or when, when they feel discomfort. So, at the moment Ubudisa came and sat on his seat, Kolta asked him, My good friend, you don't seem happy today. Is there something bothering you? Come on, tell me. And Opadisa tells Koeza, Koeza, yesterday I couldn't go to sleep. I had a thought, I had these thoughts coming through my mind. Like, what is the use of all this pleasure from the eyes and ears? They are absolutely worthless. We are, li- we are living in a life on, of an illusion. It lures us and yet leaves us with nothing. Leaves us empty. Wait, friend. You also don't seem how you're like you're happy. You don't seem like the person you were yesterday. What's going through your mind? My good friend Upadisa. The same thoughts have gone through my mind as well. You know what? We should leave. We should leave here and seek the answers to our questions. Now, over this, I said that we had, we we both have had a great thought. A great thought has come to us. We should not waste our time anymore. If we really want to seek the truth, we shall give up our possessions. We should leave home and go forth as a homeless wanderer. And I would, and they would, then we would be birds. We would be like birds soaring above world, worldly and sensual bonds. So both of them deciding to leave. They went to their friends. They went to their friends and told, explained to them what they understood. Now each of these friends were deeply impressed of what of what depth that they had been thinking and. Some of them decided to join them as well. So each of them said farewell to their friends and families. But remember, Kolita was an only child. He was the only child and he was the only male in his family. And as you may know, most families would like their well, clan to carry on. They would like to bring their family, well, carry on their family tree. So... Just imagine the fight that Koita had to go through. He was in a high caste, in a Brahman caste, and he was the only child. And his father was almost like a petty king of uh, of well, the town Koita. He was like almost like the the major, the prime minister of the of the place. <laughs> now, he had to put up up a fight. But finally, 
after uh, after putting up a pretty hard fight, his parents allowed him. So he so over this and Korita and all these friends decided, you know what? We they said farewell to their friends and families. They took off their sacred Brahman thread. So a thread that makes them well represents them as a Brahman. Now back at that time, back in those times, people used to grow their hairs and beards because only the rich can afford to wash them. Only the rich could afford to keep them smelling good and, and keeping them healthy. So they used to grow their hair and think about the amount of well, attachment that they used to have to their hair and beards. Like if I asked you to cut your or cut all your hair, how many of you would instantly say yes? But each of these people they decide to cut their hairs and beard, put on pale saffron garments. So people from high uh, from a high class, you used to wear probably like very rich clothes when with rich colors, and now they decide you know what we're gonna put on pale. Well, saffron garments. Well, well, the things that wait, wanderers used to wear. And they finally get, they discard any distinguished marks and well, anything that shows well, their privileges and well, of their class, of their caste. So they find a side, this is the way that they want to go. And so now they've entered the classless, the society of ascetism. Now, at the same time, Prince Siddhartha got married. His two be chief disciples have left home and embarked on a very different quest. Now, this different quest was extremely hard because they had to find a spiritual, a spiritual teacher who can answer and give them the path to well, answer, the, answer the questions and find a path to well, a path that will fulfill these two friends. It was a tiresome journey. They were wandering. They were, they were wanderers. They went from place to place looking for a teacher. And there are many teachers. Back in, back in India, back in those times, there are many teachers. Many teachers teaching different teachings. But has their merits, has, has their merits held them? Each of each time they went to a teacher, they felt it was hollow and they, didn't, they found the teaching hollow. There was no use of, of this teaching and so they decided they're not going to follow it. But eventually, after searching for a long, a long, long time, they found a teacher called Sanjay. And they, they decided that he spoke a little truth. And after a long search, they haven't found a single teacher that satisfied them. So they decided, you know what? Let's go learn under him. After a short time, these two friends have have found out that this teaching doesn't answer, haven't answered their question yet. That burning question that keeps driving them. They wake up to this question. They will stop at nothing until this question is answered. So, after a short time, they found out that their question isn't answered yet. So, so Kaurat and Uvdisa went to their teacher and asked, Teacher, what you have told us, we have understood. We understand everything you've told us. Is there more to be learned? And the teacher Sanjay replies, No, you both have learned my entire teaching. There's nothing more to learn. Now, this surprised the two students. That they've learned the teachings and yet they haven't answered their question. 
They're that burning question. And so they decide they're going to leave and continue their search. They're going to continue some other place. So they worship their teacher and decide to t- and tell him that they're going to they're gonna leave to find a new teacher. After all, they didn't leave their family and friends <laughs> for an endless, futile argument. But they left their family, they left all their loved ones, they left their positions, they left their high class, high caste, they left their reputation, not just for an endless, futile argument that the teacher Sanjay taught. They want to find the truth about rebirth. They want to end rebirth. They want to find the path to end rebirth. They want to end the suffering that they've experienced as well. So, on their they are on their second time in search of a teacher. So they travel throughout the country, from north to south, from east to west, through dust, through the dust of the roads, through the heat, scorching sun, through the rain, through the wind. But each time they are driven by the need to find the truth. Nothing can stop them. No, not the elements. Who knows? They may have gone hungry for days. But each time, this burning question or the 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 desire to find the truth drove them on. On that journey, they they probably met many Aztecs, many Brahmas, who have have different views and different teachings, but. Every time these two friends ask them questions and using the teaching that they learned before from the teacher Sanjay, they ask questions that understood that the teaching was empty. None of them had answered their questions. But yet, when they are, when these Aztecs ask them questions, they could answer them. So, as time goes on, at the age of 40, they decide to go home to Magandha. So from, from a young adult to the age of 40, they've been on a search for the truth. So let's, let's say that they went to this festival, say, at the age of 20. So they were searching for 20 years. Each of these twenty, each day, they probably found a new teacher. Learned a bit from him, but found out it's hollow and went to the next. After twenty years, they decide they're gonna stop. But they still didn't decide that they're gonna completely stop. They made a vow. They made a, a unbreakable. Well, they made a pact that if one of them finds this path, finds this path to deathless, deathlessness, if they find the truth, they would immediately go to their friend and tell them what they've learned. Now with their vow, they both left their, their ways and decide if they go separately, they are more likely to spread more ground and find the truth. So shortly before this moment, the Buddha had enlightened. Prince, uh, this Asli Gautama had enlightened to become the Buddha. And after the first, and the, and he's also preached the first sermon. And also after his first rain retreat, uh, retreat as I remember, uh, he set 60 disciples, so 60 arhats, to spread the Dharma, to, to spread the Dharma and oh, for the well-being and happiness of well, the world. And the Buddha himself went to Rajagaha and went to the king who soon became his follower and gave him the bam- the bamboo grove monastery. Now, these two friends were still searching. But one day, Kohitha could see in the distance Oputisa, his friend Oputisa walking walking towards him. There was something different. 
he could sense that there was something different in him. Whether it was a smile or whether it felt like he was, he was bubbling with happiness. There was something different. So immediately, as Upadisa came near, Kota asked, Friend, you seem different. You seem extremely happy. Tell me, have you found the path to deathlessness? And Upadisa again says, Yes, dear friend, I have found it. And he explains the story that he found he found a monk who said he didn't know much, but yet his appearance was very serene and delightful. And he recited a, a phrase. And uh, you may know, may know, may not know. He said he recited a Pali, phra- a Pali phrase. So yo yo dhamma hetu pava. Which I found the translation of of those things that arise from cause. The Tathagata has preached the causes and also has preached the cessation. This is doctrine of the, the great recluse. The moment Upatissa heard this from the, this monk, he became a stream enter or a sotapan. And as he recited it back to Kolita, Kolita also became a stream enter. At once Kolita decided, you know what? Okay, so let's go to the, this, this Buddha. Let's go to this Buddha right now. I would like to meet him. But Upadisa had a different idea. Upadisa decided you know what? Let's go to our teacher. Our teacher, remember the teacher Sanjay? Let's go to him and let's well show him or tell him that what we've learned. And hopefully he'll come with us as well. So both of them went to their te- the previous teacher and said to him, We have found what we've been looking for. We have found the truth. But the teacher Sanjaya, he declined the offer. But he also said, uh, you know what? You know, you've learned so much from me. I will give you, well, leadership of my students. And you can lead them and you can lead others and you can be famous. And you'll be greatly respected and you'll be respected from... And everyone will respect you like they respect me. But Upadis and Kota there well, had a small, well, had a smile on their face and said, Teacher, we don't mind being students for life. Now you have to decide whether you're going to come with us or not because our, de- our decision is final. Now this teacher surprised that his two stu- his two stu- best students don't want leadership of his of his others of the others. But yet he was also well disrupted as well because he was he was in he was in decision. He wants to go but yet he doesn't. So as he couldn't control his this this feeling of he couldn't decide because he couldn't decide. He lamented, I can't go, for, as for many years I've been a teacher. And my students have learned, uh, have learned a lot from me. If I become a pupil again, <laughs> it will be like a, ma- a mighty lake turning into a small palo. But yet he was torn between the truth and to preserve his supreme status or his, his ego. He couldn't decide whether he wanted the truth or whether he wanted to keep his ego. But he obviously decided the latter and said, my great students, I'm going to stay. You both go. 
So at the time, Sanjaya had around 500, stu- uh, 500 disciples. And these two, the Upadisa and Kota went to these 500 and said, told them what they've learned. Said they, they found the truth. They found what they've been looking for. And all of them wanted to go. All of them decided that they want to go. But they found out their teacher isn't, isn't leaving. So half of them stayed while the other half left. Now, as the 250 leave, the teacher couldn't hold this grief, this despair. Because he couldn't leave because he said he, he profaned that he was a teacher of, of many students and and he couldn't, he, he was a mighty lake and he couldn't be a puddle. But at that moment, it says, it, it is said that Hot blood spurted from his mouth. Basically vomited blood. Because he couldn't handle his despair. His grief. So. The two great friends and the other 250 uh, other disciples. Went to the mango grove Grove monastery. Now. The Buddha saw this group. This group coming close, approaching. And he told his monks, Monks, do you see those two, uh, those two people coming at, in the front? Yes, those two friends. They will be my chief disciples. Now, as, as the two friends and the 250 others came into the Buddha, they immediately asked for ordination. They would like they would they uh, they asked if they could be ordained under the Buddha. So Upadisa, as he was the son of, of he was son of his mother called Sari, he became Sariputta. And Golda was named Moggallana the Great because he wanted to be uh he 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 had to have, he had to have a name that's different to other major clans. So he was named Mahamogalan. After the ordination of these 250 and the two friends, the Buddha preached the Dharma. Each of them became Sotapanna. And each of them came, went on their path and became an Arahat by the end of the sermon. Everyone except Sariputta and Mongalan. Now Sariputta, he decided that he's going to leave and go to this cave in uh, in Bo's Den, as I remember. He went to the city for arms, and because he went to this this uh, this cave, he was able to listen to the Buddha's discourses. And within fourteen days, and at the end of fourteen days, so two weeks, he became an arahat. But whereas Moggallana, Maha Moggallana went to the forest in Kapilavastu. Uh, no, Kapilavastu, in, in uh, a forest in uh, Kala Vela uh, Putta, I think. And so he started meditating there. But he was also human, don't forget. We are talking about humans who, like you and I, have problems as well, have defilements as well. See, Mahamogalana had a problem as every time he meditates, he keeps dro- his head keeps drooping. He keeps falling asleep. Because, think about it, for 40 years he's been wandering. He's been walking from city to city, place to place, looking for a teacher. And he's, a, he's at the age of 40 after a, a lot of work. And his body is also very tired. So, he felt sleepy. But he didn't want to go sleep. He wanted to go on this path and he wanted to finish it. 
but yet when he meditates he, he kept falling asleep now the buddha through his divine eye could see this he could see that one of his disciples are falling asleep so with his with his supernatural powers he sent a light to mahamogalana and told him or gave him a discourse on what to do if you feel sleepy he said i can't remember everything he said but he said things like um, change your thoughts maybe change your karma stana maybe uh, repeat the his uh, repeat the discourse in your mind or like pulling your earlobes or getting up washing your face etc etc and after that the mahamogalana started do this and the buddha kept on giving him discourse now he went on the meditation under the guidance of the buddha it was only because he meditated under the guidance of the buddha he became an arahant and also supported by his master mahamogalana had gone into states of, of of jhana or states of samadhi as well and in the end he was able he he had well, supernatural powers mahamogalana there after striving hard after being after falling asleep and so on and so forth he became an arahant within a week even after these two friends became an arahant they were still inseparable they used to do they still were together but they weren't they didn't have any attachment but yet they were still together after they became an arahant the buddha made mog uh, Sariputta, um, Sariputta Thero and Moggallan Thero to be his chief disciples. And then, as you can guess, right, they, they, they were newly ordained. After a week and after two weeks, they both became an Arahat. And so most other monks and other people were pretty jealous that he made them chief disciples. But the Buddha says, they've been fulfilling the requirements for eons they feel of fulfilling the parameters for eons and so that's why they became the chief disciples soon they became the role models of many people many people were ordained under having them as role models they wanted to become like sariputta and mongala mothers used to tell their children children if you want to stay as a as a householder or as, in a lay life be like chitta chitta the householder but if you want to go forth be like sariputta the, the great arhat sariputta the great arhat mahamongala eh he said that sariputta was like a mother who gave birth so giving birth means making uh his students so taban whereas mahamogalana nurse them to become an arhat so like nursing uh children to become like teachers becoming making help them become good and great people mahamogalana was like that and help them become an arhat even the even prince siddhartha's child or as we all know him rahula had sariputta as a, as a, his teacher and mahamogalana as his as his uh, as he as he taught spiritual practice they were the stars of many people's eyes many people decided that they want they ordained hoping to be like them now as life goes on time starts to disappear half a month before the buddha's para pinibar sariputta maharatan vandi passed away in his pants home 
But at this time, Mahamogan Hanuman Rahat Nunanze had a small meeting with Mara. See, Mara decided that he's, he, would, he was going to go into well, the stomach of Mahamogalan. So Mahara instantly went in the stomach of, of Mahamogalan and the moment he went in the stomach, Mahamogalan, the great Mahamogalan, decided, told him immediately to get out. Mahara was astonished to be discovered that quickly. And he was under the delusion that even the Buddha won't be able to do this quickly. Again, Mahamogalana told him to get out. So Mara reluctantly came out of the mouth of Mahamogalana and Mogalana, they were, the great Arhat Mogalana told him that, that he had known Mara in his past lives as well. That their connection was very old and deep. Because in the first Buddha, in this Badrakapu or this this fest, uh, fest I think festive uh, it's called uh, the festival eon. Mahamogalana was called Mar Dusti. Dusti. I had a sister called uh, Kali. Who had a son who, be, who, who became the Mara of our time. So the Mara that we have now is basically his uncle would be Mahamogalan who had passed who, who passed away, right? So Mara Dosti, uh, at, the, at the time of the first Buddha in this Buddha Kalpa, possessed a small boy and threw shards of a clay pot at the chief disciple. Who at, the to- uh, who, who, at the to- who at the time was called Vidura. Seeing this action, the Buddha just looked at this Mahadrashti and he dissolved and reappeared in the deepest hell. Now, at this, at this moment, Mahamogalana was again reminded of the the suffering that he went through in the great hells. And yet, he was now free from it. He was now free. He, he felt, he, he reminded himself that he was free from his great hells. That he's now going to be reborn again. Soon Mara, Mara left, extremely f- scared, and left. But yet, Mahamogalana soon after felt that his time was running out. But as he was an arahat, he didn't mind, he didn't care. Now before before uh, before we, we talk about how Mahamogalana passed away, throughout the great throughout the life of this great arahat, as you may know, he he was he was just second to the Buddha in supernatural powers. He had powers beyond, well, behind powers behind many other people, many people. I I won't go through uh, many stories about his supernatural powers, because he had powers like well, telekinesis. Uh, he could read uh, minds. He had um, he could see things, uh, um, see other beings, and so on and so forth, but. But I, the, I, like, I won't go through those stories. But I, I like to go. I would like you to also imagine that you had imagine right. At one point, the um, the Buddha didn't have uh, Buddha and his disciples didn't have many uh, had anything to eat because of an event that happened previously, and so Mahamogalana Thero said that to the Buddha. Uh, Buddha, if you want, I could um, split the world in half and and take out uh, uh, the essence of um, 
uh, the essence and give it to you. The uh, give it to you. The Buddha declined this. He uh, he said, um, "What well, what's going to happen to all, all these animals?" Then he said, uh, and then Mahamogalantero said that I would uh, I will make another word exactly like this and replace them all there. <laughs> and the Buddha again declined. And said, "No, we're not going to do we're not going to do that." And then Mahamogalantero again. Uh, gave the idea. Why don't we, uh, why don't I open the gates to go to another world and or, or we can have um, arms there? Again, the Buddha declined. And yet, and then also there's other other stories like um, the uh, the great King Sakra. Yeah, he was enjoying the pleasure of his heavenly plane and not able to feel the suffering that he wasn't going. Uh, he wasn't following the path uh, to be, uh, through the Dharma. So Mahamogalantero just went to there and he just literally placed his big toe onto the throne and the whole palace started to shake. Now think about the amount of power that he had. Now I would like you to put yourself in his shoes. Imagine you had the power like that. What would you have done? I would like you to take a moment and think about it, right? What would you have done? You had the power to do almost anything. <laughs> like, what would happen to... <laughs> what would happen when you felt like when you were bored? What would happen when you were angry, when you were happy, when you were sad? You would do many things that you would in the future regret. Because power can is destruction of many people. Like uh, I remember a quote that says, greed is the root of all evil. Now, now, to be honest, when I was reading uh, the the stories of the of the great Arhat, I was surprised to see like how little stories that he had of his supernatural powers. Because if you think about it, if you if you had this much powers, how many stories would they make about you? Like how many things would you have done? But none of but Mahamogalantero didn't do anything for his own benefit, or just to show off, or just to show that he had these powers. He did it for others, whether it's it's by explaining, uh, showing them something that they didn't understand, or whether it's um, helping the Buddha in some other way. It wasn't for his own benefit. It was for the, it was entirely for others. So he he spent his life nobly. From the time he became, a, he, from the time he met the Buddha, to the end of his life, he spent his life. He spent a very noble life. He spent a very happy life. Now, as we reach the end of of. His life, right? So, as we all know, the Buddha has have went into Parinibbana, going through a med, uh, going through like a medita med meditative state, and Sariputta passed away in his parents' house, and Anand, uh, and Ananda, at the age of 120, 120, I think, uh, had his body vanished. Like he made his body vanish, so they didn't have to, they, like he, he, like people didn't have to uh, worry about his body. So they all seem so very calm and nice, right? But the way Mahamogalanda passed away was very different. He was to pass away a fortnight after Sariputta, Maharatan Mahasaya.
No. Imagine Rain. He was alone in the forest, in a in a in a forest hut, right, in uh, a place called Black Rock, on the mountain Isigili. Now, at the time, many other religious, uh, te- uh, religious spiritual teachers really disliked um, Hamogalan because he used to uh, almost, they almost thought that he used to steal their followers. He stole their followers from them. He stole uh, the, he stole their benefits. He, he stole their fame from them. And so, and as they were spiritual teachers and and they, they had many followers, they couldn't do anything to him themselves. So they, and they, so they paid a, a group of robbers or group of thieves to to do something to him, or to kill him, basically. So. Imagine, right? Day number one, right? He was meditating in this uh, forest hut and he could hear these people coming. And as they reached his hut, he slipped through the keyhole. And so these thieves came into this hut and to find it surprisingly empty. Disappointed, they left. But they came the second day. But Mahamogalana, before they entered, he escaped through the roof. So again, the um, thieves came. Again, it was empty. Again, the third day, fourth day, uh, some stories say uh, for months, some stories say uh, he came seven times, but... He escaped because he was not scared of death. He wasn't. Fe- he wasn't. He wasn't in the fear of dying. He escaped out of the complete compassion for, uh, for these thieves. Because, as you may know, killing an anahat is an ananti parvkarma, which means you'll be born in the great, the, well, the worst hell. And you'll be there for eons. So out of the compassion for these thieves, he escaped. But seeing that this, there's no use of escaping, he decided to let, well, let nature take itself. So the next time, he let the thieves take his life. But before that, he would he went into meditation and and try to investigate why why are they coming after me and trying to kill me and he saw that in his previous life in a previous life many many eons ago he had a mother and father who were blind he loved his parents so much. And like you and I love our parents. He loved his parents so much. He used to take care of them and make whenever they, they help them in the needs and walk and if they want to go somewhere, help them walk. But soon these parents decide, son, you're old enough. You should get married. After after declining the offer two or three times. Because it felt like, and because it was their wish, he decided that he was going to marry. Now, the woman he married seemed nice. But soon after, a few months, maybe, she said that, you know what, I can't live with your parents anymore. They can't do anything for themselves. They can't go to the toilet. They can't cook. They can't clothe themselves because you see they're blind, right? I can't live my rest of my life looking after them. So, husband, you make your decision. Right? Whether you want me, or you want me, or whether you want them. 
Now, after a long, uh, after a lot of thought, after thinking again and again and again, he decided that he's going to get rid of his parents. Now he had he had to find a way to get rid of them without them knowing what happened. So he decided that he was, he's going to set he's going to uh, plan a trip with his parents. So they decide they're going to go on this trip and they go through the middle of, they go in the middle of a forest. Now. As they go through this forest, in the, in the middle of this dark forest, he shouted, Mom, Dad, well, Mother, Father, there are thieves around us. They're, they're going to take our stuff. And they're going to kill us all. And he goes into the forest and gets a stick and starts beating his parents. Beating his parents until they drop dead onto the floor. And a group of bypassers got to see this. And they vowed. Look, look at the, the thing this young man did. He killed his parents. This is this is not this is not right. I we will we will take revenge. We'll revenge for this mother and father. But to be honest, <laughs> this man did not need revenge. Because after that, for many eons, he was born in the great house because, again, killing a mother and father is an ananti pap karma, which means it's a it's one of the five heinous acts. Which means he, he was destined to be born in the great house. It was destiny, right? Uh, so he was born there, and even his last, and even after he was, after being born in the great in the, in the great house, uh, even after he was born as a human, he was again murdered. And even until his last life. So in his last life. So. Let's come back to the story right. In his last life. He's, again, he's now sitting. In this hut. Waiting for death. Or will now greet death like a friend. So now the thieves come. And they were promised money if they if they killed this, this Arhat, right? But they decide not because think about it, right? They're thieves. They obviously have daggers and they probably have like knives and stuff like that. But they decided to go and get again mass, massive sticks, logs, and beat this Arhat, the Muhammad Galana, until it says until his his bones were the size of grains of rice think about it they could have killed him any other way but they decided they're gonna they decided to murder him with a grain of rice they are because these thieves are promised money after that they threw the, bo the body into the forest and fled hoping that they're gonna receive the money but through but with as with the power and with the life he has left Mahamogalana there Pulled his body together and went to the Arahat, uh, went to the Buddha. Sorry. Uh, and the Buddha told, told him to give the last sermon and to show his physical power, his psychic, his supernatural powers. So, as asked, he gave a last sermon and showed, and showed some of his supernatural powers. And he asked permission finally from the Buddha to pass away. The Buddha gave him permission. So therefore, he passed away. And that's the end of the great Arahat. He was he will now not be born again. He has stopped his journey through Sansara. 
So his book of life was ended as a full stop. And the book's now closed and put onto a shelf. It's not going to be written again. You have left Sansara. Now, even in his last moment, only the karma only was able to affect the body. His mind, he, he was pure in his mind. He had no anger toward these thieves. But no matter what, no matter how he passed away, he's not going to be re reborn again. You see, the great Arahat has passed away, have left Sansara, while we are still there, going through. Now, I hope the story, you, you were able to collect qualities from, from the great Arahat, Mongalan, Mahamogalan. You were able to collect some of the, he, he, throughout the story, he, he was, well, he had many great qualities. I hope you were able to collect some of them. And I hope this, through the story, you've made him, you were able to see the great qualities and like the people back in, back in that, that back, in, back in the past. I would like to, I hope that this will make him a, one of your role models as well. Now, I hope that, like, I hope, I know I didn't do the full justice to his qualities. But through the things I've, to, uh, the, the story I've, re I've retold, I hope you're able to well, understand and collect the qualities and hope that you're able to put these qualities into your life. And I hope that through the story, you also decided that you're going to strive no matter what. Just like, um, call it a strive to have his, uh, his burning question answered. Strive through dust, strive through the wind, strive through the rains. I hope you also strive to attain your, uh, to attain your salvation as well. I hope you all will strive no, and give, give great effort for your Nibban as well. Okay. And that brings us to, to the end of today's uh, sermon. So before we end, let's take a few moments to transfer merits and close the sermon. Okay. <laughs> Let us take a moment to transfer the merits that we've all acquired by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the Noble Chubu Gem, chanting period, listening to the Dharma, and, in, in, and engaging in various meritorious deeds today. So first and foremost, let us remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching. And with immense gratitude, let us transfer these merits to the Bhikshu Bhikshunis, Upasakas, Upasikas, who since time immemorial have protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down to the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Triptika, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dharma. Let us also transfer the merits that we have acquired to all the members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief bullets of all the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient, sentient beings. Let us not forget among, the, the, among them are monks and nuns resident to your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin to rain, come rain or shine. Let us also transfer these merits to Guru Swami Mahanse and all the other monks resident in this monastery, as well as the Anagarikas, the Anagarikas attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits and express our gratitude to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha 
be that by transliterating these sermons, sharing them out with others, inviting them to join them. May through the power of their merits, if any of them have been born on the local plane, may they redeem themselves and be born on the visible plane. May by the power of these merits, may they abstain from unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also transfer merits, the merits we require to our devotees, friends of the monastery, who for the sake of merits continue to, to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes every one of you who have contributed to this construction of the monastery, to those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes, medicines, as well as those who passed in know how and extended their well wishes. By, may through the power of the merits, may they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, before the meritorious deeds, before the noble for path and pain supreme as Nibban. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to our mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, nieces, our elders, friends, acquaintances, employers, employees, and to all those who have helped us, supported us, assisted us in, in, in any way, shape, or form. By the power of their merits, may they be healed of any physical or mental ailments. May they overcome the obstacles in their spiritual progress. May, by the, may they abstain from their meritorious, meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble effort path, and sustain and attain the supreme as Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us take a, also take a moment to transfer merits to the devas, brahmas, spirits, demons, and um, primarily the Sakra de Deva, as well as the numerous gods and deities who have committed, them, committed to protect and fulfill the Buddha's sasana. Let us transfer merits to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us, keep us out of harm's way. May through the power of the merits, may they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May by the power, may, may by the power of the merits, may they abstain from their meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme as Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to our ancestors who, prece who predecease us. To all those who have been our family, friends, acquaintances in this infinitely long journey in Sansara. And those who have helped us, supported us, assisted us in any way they could. Let us transfer these merits. Let us also transfer, transfer these merits to the member of the armed forces as well as the police force who have sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation. May all those who have lost lives in the war, be their friend or foe, rejoice in the merits they have acquired today. Let us also transfer merits to those who have lost their lives in natural calamities such as tsunamis, earthquakes, landslides, pan and pandemics, reminding ourselves among them will be those who have been friends and family to us in this, in this long journey in Sansara. Let us take a moment to transfer merits to them. May through the power of these merits, if any of them have been born on the willful plane, may they redeem themselves and be born on the blissful plane. May they abstain from the meritorious deeds, fulfill the, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble effort path and the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Finally, let us, let us also resolve that may through the power and the blessings of all the merits we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the event of many hundreds and thousands of Ayatmans in this blessed land itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may through the power of all the merits we have acquired today, you and I and everyone who have helped make this program a success, become an Arhat Nwanse, become an Arhat Mahin Nwanse in this very and very life and the era in the era of the Gautama, Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessing of the Noble Chopper Gem be with you all. We will now conclude the sermon there. May you attain supreme wisdom.